The topics discussed in this episode and some of the language used is not appropriate for all audiences. Please do not listen while children are in the room. And if you have trauma, particularly related to sexual abuse, please listen with caution. All resources are provided in the show notes. In today's episode, people who favor keeping prostitution illegal tend to believe it's a way of deterring sexual sin. Doing so, it's believed, keeps the morality of culture in check. It seems like an issue both conservatives and liberals can get behind. Conservatives tend to see prostitutes as a moral scourge on society. Liberals tend to view prostitutes as victims of abuse, manipulative coercion, and trafficking. Calls to recriminalize pornography stem from this same sentiment. It's very easy to see as social injustice or morally depraved behavior and arrive at the conclusion, there ought to be a law. But making laws against things doesn't mean they go away. It doesn't mean our problems get solved or even that justice is served. It begs the question, what is the purpose of law? Are there ways in which decriminalization leads to greater justice and societal morality? In this episode, I'm excerpting from a longer conversation I had with Melissa Bordeaux on the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Bordeaux is an attorney and advocate for decriminalizing prostitution. She helps break down the debate over the issue of sex work and the three views of it, prohibition, legalization, and decriminalization. Join me, Carrie Baldwin, as we dare to think about the injustice of criminalized sex work. So sex work is a broad umbrella term. It was coined by Carol Lee to sort of make clear that sexual erotic labor can be work. And I say it's an umbrella term. It includes all forms of erotic labor. It includes prostitution, which of course is what people primarily think of. It also includes dancing, fetish work, porn, phone sex, although that might be a little dated, any kind of erotic labor, right? Including sugaring, escorting, et cetera. And the vast majority of sex work is actually legal. It's really when we start talking about prostitution that we start to talk about things that are illegal. And then prostitution is the direct exchange of sexual conduct for a fee. The definition varies state by state. Every single state in the country, except for Nevada, has a penal code, a statewide penal code that criminalizes prostitution. So they're all framed a little bit differently. But in general, it is sexual conduct, which is usually defined as the touching of another's genitals by case law. Usually isn't defined in the statute itself in exchange for a fee, right? Which is, again, why something like dancing or certain kinds of fetish work or most kinds of fetish work are fully legal. And then human trafficking necessitates force, fraud, or coercion being involved, right? So there is federal definition of human trafficking, and then there's also state by state. Almost every single state in the country has its own human trafficking law. But sort of the overarching theme is... If there is a minor who is induced into prostitution, so really anyone under the age of 18, if they're engaging in prostitution, they are a victim of trafficking. And then if you are 18 and above, there has to be force, fraud, or coercion. So we're thinking of situations where, you know, someone truly cannot escape the situation that they are in without threat of, you know, violence or danger or blackmail or having their family harmed, et cetera. Right. So why is it important for our audience to understand the distinctions between these terms? So unfortunately, there is, you know, an incredible amount of conflation that happens between human trafficking and sex work. And the reason that's a problem is it, from a policy person's perspective, is it it creates really bad law, right? So if we're like, well, we want to help these people over here, but we're going to do something that then either catches way too wide a net, and so we're trapping, you know, a bunch of folks that don't fit a definition into our law, into our grasp, well, that's not good. And the inverse is, is not good as well, right? If we're sort of like not supporting the people that we actually want to support. And so, you know, I'll give an example. I live in New York City. We have the Vice Squad in the NYPD. 
and they say, oh, we're going to go and rescue people who are being trafficked. Well, what do they do? They bust into massage parlors, primarily in Queens, primarily of Asian undocumented women. They arrest them. They are often deported or their immigration status is put at risk. And oopsies, they don't find any human trafficking. Mm. Right. And so, all in the name of human trafficking, they're going in, often raping, assaulting massage workers, arresting them, abusing them, terrifying them, and getting them into legal trouble. And so, again, that's all in the name of rescue. Right. And so, who are we rescuing here? Nobody. And so, we see that again and again and again when we conflate sex work with human trafficking. Decriminalization, which is what we advocate for which would remove criminal penalties from both parties or all parties, really, who are not exploitative, right? And that's a really important point. So remove penalties from the sex worker, from their client. And the reason I mentioned third party is that very often what we see is you might be sharing a space with another worker and say, well, I'll work here Monday to Wednesday. You see clients here Thursday to Saturday. But if one person gets arrested, the other person could also be criminalized, right? Nobody's exploiting the other. And nobody's even bet, you know, maybe they share the rent, but because you're sort of, you know, adjacent to someone who's engaging in prostitution, you can also be criminalized, right? So that's what we mean when we say, you know, third parties. We're certainly not talking about decriminalizing anyone that engages in exploitative or abusive behavior, right? And then legalization is different. You know, the example we have in the United States, the only example is in Nevada, right? There are legal regulated brothels in Nevada in small rural counties. But it's sort of fascinating to have that experiment, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, within the United States. But what's so fascinating is I think that system works for some of the people that can be part of the system, right? The sex workers that can jump through the hoops to work. The problem is, and Nevada is a perfect example, all the rest of the sex workers are left outside of it, right? So in Las Vegas, in Reno, there's no legal sex work. But of course, we all know, you know, people go to Vegas, people go to Reno, but you know, what's happening there? So it really creates this two-tiered system where a small percentage of people are operating in a legal regulated brothel system and everyone else is operating outside of it. In Nevada, prostitution is only legal. It is licensed or permitted by the state in rural areas. So rather than sex being sold on the black market through pimps, it's sold on the open market through state-sanctioned brothel owners. It is illegal to operate outside of the open market. So black market for unlicensed sex work still occurs in Las Vegas and Reno, Nevada. I've linked to a documentary called Sold in America in the show notes. It describes well how legalized brothels work in Nevada. Though, take note, the documentarians explicitly say that legalization is the libertarian model. I must insist that it's not. By contrast, Rhode Island inadvertently decriminalized sex work from 1980 to 2009. It was found, however, that decriminalization resulted in a 30% decrease in rape offenses and a 40% decrease in STIs. A link to information in the show notes about that as well. There's one country where sex work has been decriminalized, and that's New Zealand. We'll get into that later. So with these definitions and distinctions out of the way, let me introduce you to Julie Bendel. I've not met her, but she did participate in a Soho Forum debate on the topic of decriminalization of sex work. Bendel is a feminist scholar from the UK who favors what's known as the Nordic model on prostitution. In fact, most Christian organizations fighting against human trafficking favor the Nordic model. I want to play a clip from Bindel from that debate. A link to the full debate is provided in the show notes. In this clip, Bindel is against full decriminalization. She favors, instead, decriminalizing the sale of sex while criminalizing the purchase of it or the demand for it. Listen. If you decriminalize the women 
This is an open road to justice. We have to reform the police because the police are absolutely, in your country, they're even worse than mine. But we campaign against police wrongful arrest and brutality. We campaign against the impunity with which police are treated when they commit acts of violence against the women. But decriminalizing the women will be a start. The men have to be deterred. Let me pause for a moment. I want to point something out. Several common political issues are based on the idea that criminalizing the purchase of a thing will deter the purchase to begin with. Gun control, drug and alcohol prohibition, and abortion are examples. We not only have strong evidence against criminalizing one or both sides of the supply and demand curve, that is, that it doesn't actually deter anything, but we also have no substantial evidence that doing so creates the deterrence that we intend. And yet, it remains a clarion call for politicians. Okay, let's continue. The men have to be deterred because they have no right to pay for sex, whether they are disabled, veterans coming back from fighting a noble war, which is always the stereotype, the man who can't get a real date. Disabled rights groups have gone berserk about that one, and rightly so. Or whether they say that this is something they have to do, or, and I quote directly from John's I've interviewed, they'd have to go out and rape a real woman. This is the bleakest picture of masculinity and of men I've ever heard in my life. All men are potential rapists is not a phrase or a belief that comes from feminists like me. It comes from the Johns. They've honestly convinced themselves that they can't keep it in their zipper and that their penis will drop off if they can't get access to a woman immediately. I have heard this before. While Bindell has no doubt heard the most stark examples of this language, I've heard it in purity culture circles. In her book, Talking Back to Purity Culture, author Rachel Joy Welcher writes, quote, At Christian youth camps and during school chapels, I heard the same message over and over again. Men can't help their lust, but women can. Jonathan Trotter confirmed the proliferation of this wrong thinking in the church when he admitted, quote, I grew up learning of the guy's responsibility to not look, and that's great, but what I really heard a lot about was the girl's responsibility to not be looked at, end quote. More on this in a moment. This is not the case. We know that this isn't what men are programmed to do and be like, and we also know that in a society where those in prostitution are overwhelmingly multiply disadvantaged. They're women of color, they're black women, they're indigenous women, they're poor women. They've had histories of trauma and child abuse. What are we doing saying that some women should, and I quote directly from a sex trade survivor I work with and I know, why should some women be a spittoon for men's semen? Women of all classes And all cultures, races, and positions in society deserve the dignity of not being bought and sold by the men who, quite frankly, can keep it in their zipper. I happen to share some of Bendel's sentiment here. I don't believe men are created to be uncontrolled, lascivious fiends who need a female receptacle as an outlet. That certainly is the bleakest view of masculinity. I don't believe Brudeau thinks this either, but I'm not sure how many people involved in the sex trade are there voluntarily or not. Bindell, like other feminists, is certain the overwhelming majority have not made a genuine choice. Bindell wants to account for prostitutes who are there due to trauma. Brudeau would not deny trauma in sex workers, but there's a principal disagreement between the two about the proper remedy for these sex workers. Should the state intervene in a woman's decision to sell herself for sex, to rescue her from trauma she isn't aware of or ready to deal with? Or should a woman's agency, decision to participate in sex work, be respected by the state even if we would disagree with her or believe she deserves better? Bordeaux points out that we simply don't know the data on who's there voluntarily and who's not. Do we know how many 
or roughly, I assume it would have to be an estimate, roughly how many women and girls are being trafficked versus how many are voluntarily entering into it? We don't. And, you know, it's interesting. There was a study, and I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, a study done by some professors at John Jay in New York City about minors. And which again, by federal law and by you know every state law, you know would be considered to be trafficked. But what was so fascinating there was that most of the youth did not identify as being forced. It was well, I gotta you know do what I have to do. And and also, I think it was over half were boys. Oh wow, right, or young men that don't get talked about, that get right. you know eradicated in the discourse. I know you brought up Julie Bindel. And there's tons of second wave feminists that just see this through a completely sort of patriarchal Mm -hmm. lens, which erases sex workers of all genders in that conversation. If boys and young men are becoming prostitutes as well, then we should be asking very different questions about causes. While it appears true, the overwhelming number of adult prostitutes are still women, we should stop and ask why half of underage prostitutes are male. Bindel isn't doing that. But Bindel raised another good point. The kind of men purchasing sex really have a very low view of women and of sex, incidentally. Here's a clip from Sold in America. The host had interviewed a man who had been convicted for purchasing sex from a prostitute. His punishment was to take a course aimed at teaching Johns why purchasing sex is wrong and how to not do it again. She asked this John, who didn't want his identity revealed, what his view of women was in his purchasing of sex. Can I ask about your just kind of, I guess, mentality towards women while you were buying sex? Like, did you have any, I don't know, specific thoughts about women? I was mad at my wife. It's, for me, it's kind of as simple as that. And I know it's like, horrible like coping mechanism to see prostitutes because they're mad at my wife your wife but that's why that's why I did it yeah that's why I did it it was you know and then it became a compulsive behavior for me it's just something I did a lot I was just used to it it was like an escape he did it because he was mad at his wife I'm going to come back to the decriminalization topic in a minute, because this problem goes deeper than just loser men seeking easy sex. Both Bendel and the John in Sold in America both allude to the real problem being how some men think of themselves and of women. What these conversations reminded me of was the evangelical purity culture movement. So please pardon my detour for a moment. I mentioned earlier Welcher's book about purity culture. She has a section discussing some connections to rape culture. But there has been major pushback over whether rape culture is a real thing. Libertarian feminist Wendy McElroy, in an article she wrote decrying the big lie of rape culture, writes this, quote, The Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, RAIN, is America's largest anti-sexual violence organization. In a letter of February 28th addressed to the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault, Rain rejected the idea of America as a rape culture. The letter stated, quote, Rape is caused not by cultural factors, but by the conscious decisions of a small percentage of the community to commit a violent crime. While that may seem an obvious point, it has tended to get lost in recent debates. As a result, the letter continued, the dialogue on rape has tended to focus on particular segments of the student population, for example, athletics, or traits that are common in many millions of law-abiding Americans, for example, masculinity, rather than on the subpopulation at fault, those who choose to commit rape, end quote. So whatever exists of actual rape culture is a relatively small percentage of the population. While researching this topic, I found a post from Christian sociologist Nancy Piercy. She noted that for the first time in church history, women now make up the minority of Christians. 
The longstanding history of women being the majority may simply be attributed to the fact that women tend to outnumber men in the general population. But also, there are particular reasons women have historically been attracted to Christianity, even considered more spiritually sensitive than their Christian brothers. But now that seems to be changing. She further commented with a quote from the introduction to her upcoming book, The Toxic War on Masculinity. I'll read an abbreviated version here. Link to the complete comments is in the notes. Quote, Many people assume that evangelical Christian men are patriarchal and domineering, but sociological studies have refuted those negative stereotypes. Compared to secular men, devout Christian family men who attend church regularly are more loving husbands and more engaged fathers. They have the lowest rates of divorce, and astonishingly, they have the lowest rate of domestic violence of any major group in America. This research is largely unknown, and even Christians are surprised to learn of it. The evidence shows that Christianity has the power to overcome toxic behavior in men and reconcile the sexes, an unexpected finding that has stood up to rigorous empirical testing. Sociology has uncovered that men who identify as evangelical Christians, but whose views of manhood are derived from secular culture, most of these men are nominal Christians which means they are not particularly devout and attend church rarely, if at all. They are prone to pick up terms like headship and submission, but read them through a secular lens of power and control. Surprisingly, research has found that nominal Christian men have the highest rates of divorce and domestic violence, even higher than secular men. These numbers are staggering. They tell us that men who claim the label of evangelical Christian often behave worse than men who are outright secular. Nominal men in the church skew the statistics and create the false impression that evangelical men as a group are abusive and domineering, end quote. I asked Piercy about what percentage of nominal evangelical men to devout Christian men there were, and here was her response to me. Sociological research shows that the number of active church-going evangelical family men is about equal to the number of nominal evangelical men. Both are about 15% of the total number of American family men. About 15% of the total population seems like a relatively small portion, lending to McElroy's claim that so-called rape culture is a myth. But, if Piercy is correct, and nominal evangelical men who behave worse than secular men comprise half the American evangelical population, that does constitute a culture and one that is unique to American Christianity. Which means the concerns being raised by women in the church about sex abuse and domestic violence are not only well-founded, but the problems are as deep and pervasive as they claim, and it's high time the church take it seriously. Now, What the heck does this have to do with decriminalizing prostitution? Myself and and two of my colleagues from Decriminalized Sex Work, we put on a panel talking about a law review that we got published Mm -hmm. last year exactly on this issue, on the need for comprehensive sexual health education to help diminish abuse and exploitation. Mm -hmm. We actually quote Elizabeth Smart who, you know, obviously was kidnapped. Yep. And then, of course, no one is saying education would have prevented her from being kidnapped. But what what she did say was that her sex ed that she had had growing up had taught her that, you know, you're like a piece of gum. And if you're a woman, you have sex, you're like chewed, more and more chewed up. Did you catch that? You know, you're like a piece of gum. And if you're a woman, you have sex, you're like chewed, more and more chewed up. And so she, when she emerged from her, you know, horrific situation, she felt horrific about herself. She felt the shame. She felt like a used up piece of gum. And that then carried forward, right? And again, I, you know, her situation was horrific, but how she felt afterward was reinforced by what she had learned about the expectations, right? Gender Mm -hmm. expectations and healthy relationships. Yep. There's a sermon that's given by a pastor named Matt Chandler. And he's talking about how he's at this purity culture sort of youth group thing. And he says... The the minister got up and he said, today I want to talk to you about sex. And so I immediately go, "Uh uh-oh, 
He had another pastor who hands this kid a rose. And he took a red rose and he smelled it and he showed how pretty it was. And then he threw it out into the crowd. He goes, everybody needs to smell this. And he says, okay, pass this rose around to everybody. Smell the rose. I want you to smell it. I want you to touch it. I want you to see the texture in it. And, and then as it wraps up, he goes, where's my, where's my rose? Where, where, where is it? Where's, where's my rose? And of course, by the time everybody has handled it, and, you know, some kid came up, the rose is just completely jacked up. It's broken, the things are off. It's wilted and everything's, Ugh. you know, the... <gasps> the petals are broken. And You know where I'm going with this. The, the, the petals are falling off and everything. And he lifts it up in his big crescendo. And this pastor... I mean, his point is to hold up that rose and go... And he says... Now, who would want this? And it's supposed to be this big shocker to get Christian girls to, you know, straighten oh, up God. and fly right. Yes. Many evangelical girls were raised with abstinence-only education, which entailed these ideas that if you had sex before marriage, you were used, wilted, chewed up, spit out, falling apart, secondhand, and who wants that? But sex education didn't stop there. Evangelical teaching about sex found its way into popular books about marital sex. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Dare to Think. I'm Carrie Baldwin, and I'm an independent researcher with a degree in philosophy. My mission is to reignite curiosity and thoughtful reflection by challenging and rethinking prevailing paradigms in politics, religion, and culture, and passionately promoting human freedom and flourishing. I accomplish this by producing content developed out of my work as an independent researcher. My current project is formalizing my proposal for a libertarian theory of reproductive rights, which will seek to reconcile the human rights between women and their offspring. Please subscribe to this podcast, Dare to Think, on your favorite podcatcher. And also go rate and review Dare to Think on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or Amazon. This will help others find my podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date on my latest articles and episodes, please subscribe to my monthly email list at mereliberty.com slash sign up. Now, let's get back to the episode. Sheila Ray Guaguar's book, The Great Sex Rescue, conducted research about evangelical women and their view of marriage and sex and where it came from. Entailed in the study were the sources from which women had learned this stuff. Some of it came from the pulpit, but even those sermons came from books published by so-called experts on how to have a good Christian marriage. Here are some quotes provided in Gregoire's book about what evangelical purity culture has been teaching about women, marriage, and sex. From the title, The Act of Marriage, quote, Women must cultivate the problem of visual lust, whereas men almost universally must cope with the problem just because they're men. End quote. From the title, Through a Man's Eyes, quote, Because men and women are wired so differently, women often don't realize how the opposite sex sees the world. Most women simply aren't aware of what men's visual nature means or how much it impacts literally every area of most men's lives and relationships, end quote. From the title, Every Man's Battle, quote, We find another reason for the prevalence of sexual sin among men. We got there naturally, simply by being male, end quote. From the title, For Women Only, quote, A man can't not want to look. End quote. Again, from Every Man's Battle. Quote, Maybe it's true that when you and a woman reach a door simultaneously, you wait to let her go first, but not out of honor. You want to follow her up the stairs and look her over. Maybe you've driven your car to the parking lot of a local gym between appointments, watching scantily clad women bounding in and out, fantasizing and lusting, even masturbating, in the car. End quote. Once again, from Every Man's Battle, quote, Your wife can be a methadone-like fix when your temperature is rising. And from the same series, but for women, quote, Once he tells you he's going cold turkey, be like a merciful vial of methadone for him. End quote. 
From Fidelity, How to Be a One-Woman Man by Doug Wilson. Quote, The sexual act cannot be made into an egalitarian pleasure party. A man penetrates, conquers, colonizes, plants. A woman receives, surrenders, accepts. This is, of course, offensive to all egalitarians, and so our culture has rebelled against the concept of authority and submission in marriage. This means that we have sought to suppress the concepts of authority and submission as they relate to the marriage bed. True authority and true submission are therefore an erratic necessity. Are you getting the picture? That this is something they have to do, or, and I quote directly from John's I've interviewed, they'd have to go out and rape a real woman. This is the bleakest picture of masculinity and of men I've ever heard in my life. All men are potential rapists is not a phrase or a belief that comes from feminists like me. It comes from the Johns. They've honestly convinced themselves that they can't keep it in their zipper and that their penis will drop off if they can't get access to a woman immediately. This is not the case. We know that this isn't what men are programmed to do and be like. And we also know that in a society where those in prostitution are overwhelmingly multiply disadvantaged, they're women of color, they're black women, they're indigenous women, they're poor women, they've had histories of trauma and child abuse. What are we doing saying that some women should, and I quote directly from a sex trade survivor I work with and I know, Why should some women be a spittoon for men's semen? Women of all classes and all cultures, races and positions in society deserve the dignity of not being bought and sold by the men who, quite frankly, can keep it in their zipper. Many people defend this kind of thought on the basis that men and women are different, and we must maintain those distinctions. Contrary to Wilson, you aren't egalitarian simply for arguing against the idea that human sexuality reflects male predation and female prey. Believing the ontological constituent differences between men and women entail a predator-prey mentality is not only anti-human, as it reduces humans to animalistic tendencies, ironically fundamentally Darwinian, but it's anti-Christian. We're image bearers of God, and nothing within the Imago Dei indicates a predator-prey relationship. And yet, this sort of tripe is being passed off as if it represents biblical complementarity. There is currently an outcry about attempts to groom our children by proponents of transgenderism, and rightly so. But evangelicals were groomed for predation two decades before. Gregoire's book, along with others, calling out these abuses have been ridiculed, downplayed, minimized, or completely ignored. By the way, one of Doug Wilson's deacons recently pled guilty to child porn charges. Let's go back to Matt Chandler's sermon for a moment. Chandler's point for telling this awful story about the rose analogy was to say that Jesus wants the rose, and that Jesus himself destigmatizes people for the purpose of repenting them through his loving kindness. It wasn't Jesus who tried to leverage stigma to produce adherence to the moral law. That was the Pharisees. And while Jesus didn't condone sexual sin, he didn't mockingly say of them, they get what they deserve, they should have obeyed the law. The stigma surrounding prostitution is what many people believe is the necessary deterrent. Stigma surrounding prostitution bears a striking similarity to what is taught in evangelical purity culture. Yet, not only is there no evidence to suggest such stigma produces deterrence, but what is evident is the consequent abuse of these two systems. Stigma is defined as a mark of shame or discredit. The word finds its roots in the Greek word stitzine, which means to tattoo. Stigma in the sex trade can manifest in a number of ways, but I'll focus on the ways that also affect women who are not also sex workers. And the first has to do with the legal denial of basic human rights. Prostitutes are frequently the target of serial killers, not because serial killers have a particular affinity for them, but because they know law enforcement doesn't typically make crimes against prostitutes a high priority. 
a common moniker in law enforcement, which may be falling out of practice in recent years, according to Bordeaux, is NHI, which stands for No Humans Involved. In certain jurisdictions, there would be a little NHI, No Human Involved, if there was a prostitute involved, especially, you know, sex workers have been the targets of serial killers time and again. Mm. And, you know, this is a long line in history, right? I mean, we think of Jack the Ripper who targeted sex workers in Victorian Mm -hmm. England. Sex workers have always been the targets. We still have an unsolved murder here in New York on Long Island, the Gilgo Beach murders. So the no human involved delineation sort of matches the way that other people in society see women. And so Gary Ridgway said at his trial or a sentencing, you know, I targeted prostitutes because I knew nobody would care. Nobody would look for mm. them. And he was right. He got away with it for like 30 years, you know? Wow. <laughs> he was right. And so the police delineation of no human involved, it, it shows, right? Oh, well, this yeah. person is not really a person. They brought it on themselves, their lifestyle. Like they're not really worthy of, you know, being cared about. And I think that is finally shifting. I really mm-hmm. do. But the no human involved delineation is an obvious marker of that. Rape is the one violent crime in America where a judge may consider whether the victim invited it. And this stems from longstanding stigma associated with unmarried women and the clothing they wear. Poor law enforcement protocols tend to lead to deprioritizing of rape cases, and stereotyping and lack of trauma-informed training will cause officers to disbelieve victims or view trauma responses as the victim being uncooperative. According to endthebacklog.org, research has shown that law enforcement disbelieves victims of sexual assault more than the victims of any other type of crime and often blame the victim for the crime. There's also a high price tag for the rape kits used in processing. They go for about $1,000 to $1,500 for one kit. While public crime labs struggle to keep up with the number of kits needing processing, law enforcement lack resources and technology to keep up with the untested kits. Add to this the fact that at least 40% of police officers are perpetrating domestic violence within their own homes. And you can clearly see that America has a justice system that does not take sexual crime seriously, and much of it stems from the stigma concerning women and sex. Are victims of rape stigmatized because of prostitution? Or is prostitution stigmatized because of societal views of women more broadly? In this paper that we also featured in the law review around the need for sexual health education in diminishing trafficking and exploitation and abuse, especially of women, was a lot of examples of women who are trafficked from Mexico. And I saw this with my own clients as well, where what would be used to lure them was sort of this purity and and religion, where religion is, you know, really critical sort of centerpiece, right, to people's values. And, you know, we would maybe woo her with promises of marriage and a better life. And then maybe they would sleep together. And then the tables would turn, right? Or they would get married. And then boom, I had the tables turn, become abusive, say, well, you slept with me. You can't go back. You know, what would your parents say? Or we can't get a divorce. What would your parents say? The community would shun you. And... Of course, you know, these women would be young. I'm not necessarily saying minors, but, you know, 18, 19 years old, right? Not really having a worldly, you know, understanding of things. And and I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying they yes, realize yeah. all of these things yeah. to trap and control and manipulate. And by the time... I mean, they realized obviously something was wrong, but it was it was almost like they were in too deep because of the shame and stigma. Yeah. Right? You want to escape. You're like, this is terrible and abusive. But what would be worse is going back to my family who would say I'm a whore and throw me out. That was really, you know, very, very common, especially, you know, 
like Mexico, there were certain smaller cities or towns where traffickers would go. Like that was the industry yeah. was trafficking women and manipulating and utilizing these religious values mm-hmm. for evil, really, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying the answer is no religion, right? Um, right. But I think the answer, right, is heightened education and awareness and whatever someone's religion is, you know, or isn't, everyone having an understanding of their own value and their own worth mm-hmm. and knowing that if something doesn't feel right or if something feels hurtful or harmful, to question that and yeah. and to know that there's support for them, yeah. right? Even if maybe your mom or dad or rabbi or pastor or somebody might not love what you might be engaging in, right? they're there to support you through you know, what you might be going through. What struck me about Bordeaux's commentary here is the pattern she found. Abusers exploiting religious beliefs about marriage and sex by twisting their meaning, using it to control young women, young women who were never taught better. In other words, the beliefs about marriage and sex in Christianity can make young people vulnerable to misuse and abuse of those beliefs simply because parents and church leaders thought talking about these things during the height of their sexual development would actually lead to sexual sin and deviancy. Turns out not educating our kids about these things leads to entrapment in some of the worst elements of sexual deviancy. Brudeau wasn't looking to be critical of Christianity. She happened upon these facts in her study of tangential issues. Evangelicalism is no small portion of the American population. According to Pew Research, it accounts for roughly a quarter of the population, not counting mainline Protestants, historically Black Protestants, and of course Catholics. The language of evangelical purity culture is nearly identical to the language pimps and johns use to speak about women. It's a view of masculinity and femininity that is the bleakest of humanity. And I will reiterate patently unchristian despite the evangelical popularity of it. A third kind of stigma comes from feminists like Julie Bindel. This is the idea that women are perpetual victims where the state will misinterpret a woman's no as yes by way of victim blaming for rape, feminists refuse to let a woman's yes mean yes. Patriarchalists have corresponding views of women as victims as well, but in their view, must marry to protect them against inevitable rape. Take this statement from Doug Wilson, quote, Women inescapably need godly masculine protection against ungodly masculine harassment. Women who refuse protection from their fathers and husbands must seek it from the police. But women who genuinely insist on no masculine protection are really women who tacitly agree on the propriety of rape. End quote. For all the talk about a woman's bodily autonomy and agency when it comes to abortion, some feminists don't believe a woman in her right mind would ever say yes to sex work. Patriarchalists believe this is the depravity of the female mind, which is endemic, and that's why they insist that she must be brought under the authority of a husband in marriage, already a distortion of what Christianity actually teaches. So, what's the solution? How do we change society to value women and children, abhor the evils done against them, and still maintain a system of justice? The Nordic model is a very popular idea, but it's also a failure because it's ignorant of economics. The organization Brudeau represents, Decriminalized Sex Work, has numerous studies and reports demonstrating the failure of the Nordic model. But let me explain briefly why the law of supply and demand does not lend itself well to changing behavior. First, when non-economists think of the word demand, they believe it's speaking about how much of a product consumers want. This is mistaken. Demand is a relationship between hypothetical prices of a product and the corresponding quantity a person might buy at each price. This relationship is dependent upon a person's preference, which change frequently and are not necessarily the same at any given time. So the first mistake of the Nordic model, or any policy to criminalize demand for a product or service, is that it's not addressing the root of the demand. 
a person's preference. The point that I wanted to make was that it does mm-hmm. seem to create a catch-22, right? Mm-hmm. Where whoever's involved in it, whether coerced or not, mm-hmm. whether they realize they're coerced or not, are trying to mitigate the violence against them. And it seems like the state is wanting to take away every avenue, which just shoves them back out onto the streets, which is probably the most dangerous, I would imagine, place for them to be, especially in terms of trafficking. Correct. Yeah, street-based work is way more dangerous, right, than Mm -hmm. indoor where you can find your clients online, especially in this day and age, right, where the internet... I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons to the internet, but <laughs> yeah, certainly for sex workers, it has provided a vehicle by which to safely find and screen clients. Yeah, And what ends up happening with law enforcement is things might sound like a great idea, but in the end, they're harming the people that are the most vulnerable. There's not only nothing inherently criminal about preferences, even if acting upon certain preferences would be criminal, but more importantly, legislation, words written on pieces of paper, even if agreed upon by some groups of people, don't have any effect on what individuals want. In other words, supply and demand help us understand how prices form, not how human preferences form, nor the willingness to pay money for them. There's a difference between wanting sex and the willingness to pay for it. And you can't actually eliminate demand for a product. Not only will the hypothetical prices at various quantities always exist in some fashion, the only thing that one can hope for is that preferences for certain products or services shift away from the one and toward a more suitable alternative. Understanding economics actually helps us understand how this happens. The law of demand says that if other influences stay the same, then an increase in price will lead consumers to buy fewer units, while a decrease in prices will lead them to buy more units. In the countries that have the Nordic model, we have Sweden, we have Northern Ireland, Canada effectively has you know, the Nordic model, even though that wasn't what the Supreme Court of Canada intended to do. But In Northern Ireland, the Department of Justice did a review, um, I believe it was 2019, I could be wrong, um, a three-year review of the impact of the Nordic model in Northern Ireland and actually found no decrease in demand and also that sex workers felt less safe, less supported, Mm. and reported an increase in violent or antisocial behavior, Mm. which actually makes total sense, right? So if I am a sex worker and I'm going online or on the phone and I'm trying to screen a client and the onus of criminalization is on him and I'm like, well, I need to know your real name. I need to get three references from you. I need to know where you work, blah, blah, blah there's no way he's going to want to give me that information Yeah, if the onus of criminalization is now on him. Now, obviously, in the United States, as it exists, the onus of criminalization is on both parties, but clients know there's a small percentage of the, that they'll actually be the ones arrested. Whereas with the Nordic model, it's like, oh no, the onus is fully on you now. Mm-hmm. And so that makes for a really squeamish clientele. Mm-hmm. you know, um, that is not going to want to be screened for for safety and give out any identifying information, understandably, right? Because they're yeah. like, well, what if you're an undercover cop? Willingness to buy is also not the same thing as the actual action of purchasing or having bought a thing. Applied to sex work, which we'd call a service, not a product, even if it's an immoral or a degrading service. To decrease the purchase of sex, the price must increase. There are multiple factors that go into pricing. Factors like how much money one has to spend, the price from one sex worker, the prices of her competitors, how badly you want the service, as well as other prices for tangential products and services. Criminalization tends to only affect one or a few of those factors, which is why we see shifts in behavior aimed at avoiding getting caught rather than shifting preference for an alternative product or service. Again, prohibition doesn't act as a deterrent for the sale of sex or anything else. As one sex worker put it, if your choice is obeying the law or feeding yourself or even your family, you're going to take the risk of disobeying the law. And what the Nordic model has demonstrated, and what Austrian economists understand full well, 
is prohibition doesn't deter the purchase. It only encourages the worst behavior to avoid getting caught. It also pushes the price of sex down, which incentivizes the purchase of sex to go back up, but this time among the worst of the worst. Sex workers can't gain employment in socially acceptable jobs, and so they're forced to sell sex to pay for fines they've received for selling sex in the first place. The only thing prohibition does is perpetuate the very cycle that keeps women trapped and feeds the sexual proclivities of the absolute worst in society, not to mention the exploitation of sex workers by law enforcement itself, which I mentioned earlier. How does this compare to New Zealand, where prostitution is decriminalized? While rates of prostitution have not gone down in New Zealand, decreased street-based prostitution, which carries the most risk for violence, has gone down. Sex workers and women alike are encouraged to report sexual violence to law enforcement, who tends to now take the topic more seriously. There's less force, fraud, and coercion since sex workers can now report these as crime. There is no evidence that human trafficking has been increased. Why Christians Should Be Interested in Decriminalizing Sex Work While sex workers are no doubt seeking a level of destigmatization of their work that seeks to legitimize it in the eyes of the culture, the benefit to non-sex workers from legal destigmatization is much-needed reforms of the criminal justice system that take sexual violence against women and children seriously. There is good reason to believe that rape culture is a unique problem in evangelical churches tied to the misuse and abuse of doctrines concerning women, marriage, and sex. While evangelicals have tried to blame shift to the secular world, it's clear the issue is the combination of poor doctrine, specifically patriarchal views of women, and the seemingly odd bedfellows purity culture makes with pimps and johns. Decriminalization of sex work doesn't mean you can finally rest easy that your son or daughter won't get wrapped up in sexual sin or sexual violence. It does mean the line between criminal and non-criminal is more clearly demarcated and victims of sexual violence are more likely to get justice. Jesus says in Matthew 5.37 that we shouldn't swear oaths, but simply let our yes mean yes and our no mean no. But as we've discussed here about the stigma concerning women and sex, there's a culture in the church and in the criminal justice system that not only won't hear a woman's yes or no, but insist that yes means no, and that our no means yes. While Jesus' command here certainly applies to women, it is an injustice when people won't accept our yes as yes and no as no. And our yes or no should be accepted whether you agree with it or not. Whatever our own sinful proclivities are, that's a separate issue. You can't expect anyone to take responsibility for themselves when others insist on ignoring or denying our agency. It does mean that Christian communities will finally have to talk about these issues and not ignore or sweep them under the rug, thinking that sheltering their kids or using fear to compel outward behavioral compliance will keep them safe from sexual exploitation or their own sexual sin. This not only requires reforming the criminal justice system to one that deals only with violent crime, but it also requires American Christians to take a good hard look at themselves and see if they've embraced these false ideas about women that have no place in church or society. Thank you for listening to Dare to Think. This is the official podcast of my website, MereLiberty.com. There you can find my other episodes, interviews, and articles which seek to challenge and rethink prevailing paradigms. If you like what you heard today and would like to get access to premium content, please consider becoming a monthly member. For as little as $5 a month, you can get early access to all new content, monthly research updates, and a commenter profile so you can interact with me and other members on articles and episodes. Become a premium member and unlock even more benefits. You can find that information at mereliberty.com membership and click on monthly memberships to learn more. And please do leave a review of Dare to Think on Apple and YouTube and follow me on Facebook and Twitter.